Little House on the Prairie. We're up to chapter 11. I'm going to read chapter 11 only today, and it's called Indians in the House. There's the picture. Jack the Bulldog is tied up. And Pa is going off with his gun over his shoulder. Early one morning, Pa took his gun and went hunting. He had meant to make the bedstead that day. He had brought in the slabs when Ma said she had no meat for, but when Ma said she had no meat for dinner, he took the slabs against the wall and took his gun. Jack wanted to go hunting too. His eyes begged Pa to take him and his whines came up from his chest and quivered in his throat until Laura almost cried with him. But Pa chained him to the stable. No, Jack, said Pa, you must stay here and guard the place. Then he said to Mary and Laura, don't let him loose, girls. Poor Jack lay down. It was a disgrace to be chained, and Jack felt it deeply. He turned his head from Pa and would not watch him go away with a gun on his shoulder. Pa went farther and farther away until the prairie swallowed him and he was gone. Laura tried to comfort Jack, but he would not be comforted. The more he thought about the chain, the worse he felt. Laura tried to cheer him up, to frisk and play, but he only grew more sullen. Both Mary and Laura felt that they could not leave Jack while he was so unhappy, so all that morning they stayed by the stable. They stroked Jack's smooth, bridled head and scratched him around the ears and told him how sorry they were that he must be chained. He lapped their hands a little bit, but he was very sad and angry. His head was on Laura's knee and she was talking to him when suddenly he stood up and growled a fierce, deep growl. The hair on his neck stood up and his eyes glared red. Laura was frightened. Jack had never growled before. Then she looked over her shoulder where Jack was looking and she saw two naked, wild men coming, one behind the other on the Indian trail. Mary, look, she cried. Mary looked and saw them too. They were tall, thin, fierce looking men. Their skin was brownish red. Their head seemed to go up to a peak, and the peak was a tuft of hair that stood straight up and ended in feathers. Their eyes were black and still and glittering. They came closer and closer. They went out of sight on the other side of the house. Laura's head turned and so did Mary's, and they looked at the place where those terrible men would appear when they came past the house. Indians, Mary whispered. Laura was shivering. There was a queer feeling in the middle of her, and her bones and her legs felt weak. She wanted to sit down, but she stood and looked and waited for the Indians to come around the other side beyond the house. The Indians did not do that. All this time, Jack had been growling. Now he stopped growling and was lunging against the chain. His eyes were red and his lips were curled back and all the hair on his head was bristling. He bounded and bounded clear off the ground, trying to get loose from the chain. Laura was glad that the chain kept him right there with her. Jack's here, she whispered to Mary. Jack won't let them hurt us. We'll be safe if we stay close to Jack. They're in the house. Mary whispered, they're in the house with Ma and baby Carrie. Then Laura began to shake all over. She knew she must do something. She did not know what those Indians were going to do to Ma and baby Carrie. There was no sound from inside the house at all. Oh, what are they doing to Ma? She screamed in a whisper. Oh, I don't know, Mary whispered back. I'm going to let Jack loose, Laura whistled hoarsely. Jack will kill them. Pa said not to, Mary answered. They were too scared to speak or talk out loud. They put their heads together and watched the house and whispered, he didn't know Indians would come. He said not to let Jack loose. Mary was almost crying. Laura thought of little baby Carrie and Ma shut in the house with those Indians. She said, I'm going in to help Ma. She ran two steps and walked a step. Then she turned and fled back to Jack. She clutched him wildly and hung on to his strong panting neck. Jack wouldn't let anything hurt her. We mustn't leave Ma in there alone, said Mary. She stood and trembled. Mary could never move when she was frightened. Laura hid her face against Jack and held on to him tightly. Then she made her arms let go of him. 
her hands balled into fists and her eyes shut tight and she ran toward the house as fast as she could run. She stumbled and fell down and her eyes popped open. She was up again and running before she could think. Mary was close behind her. They came to the door. It was open and they slipped into the house without a sound. The naked wild men stood by the fireplace. Ma was bending over the fire, cooking something. Carrie clung to Ma's skirts with both her hands and her head was hidden in the folds of Ma's skirt. Laura ran toward Ma, but just as she reached the hearth, she smelled a horribly bad smell and she looked up at the Indians. Quick as a flash, she ducked behind the long, narrow slab that leaned against the wall. The slab was just wide enough to cover both of her eyes. If she held her head perfectly still and pressed her nose against the slab, she couldn't see the Indians and she felt safer, but she couldn't help moving her head just a little so that one eye peeped out and she could see the wild men. First, she saw their moccasins, their stringy, bare, red-brown legs all the way up. Around their waists, each of the Indians wore a leather thong and the furry skin of a small animal hung down in front. The fur was striped black and white, and now Laura knew what made that smell. The skins were fresh killed skunks. A knife, skins, skunk skins. A knife like Pa's hunting knife and a hatchet like Pa's hatchet were stuck into each skunk skin. The Indian's rib, ribs made little ridges up their bare sides. Their arms were folded on their chests. At last, Laura looked again at their faces and she dodged quickly behind the slab. Their faces were bold and fierce. Their eyes glittered high on their forehead, on their heads and above their ears where hair grows. Those wild men had no hair, but on top of their heads, a tuft of hair stood up straight. It was round around with a string and feathers were stuck in it. Okay, I'm gonna show you what they look like. So first of all, here's Laura, and she's hiding behind that slab of wood that Pa had to make the bed, the frame of the bed he's gonna make. She's hiding behind it and just peeking out. And here's what's happening. Ma's cooking. Baby Carrie's now on the bed, but you can see the two Indians. And baby Carrie is now on the bed, just staring at them. When Laura peeked out from behind the slab, both Indians were looking straight at her. Her heart thumped into her throat and choked her with its pounding. The two eyes glittered down into her eyes. The Indians did not move, nor, sorry, one Indian was staring at her. Both Indians were looking straight at her. <clears throat> Two black eyes glittered straight into her eyes. The Indian did not move. Not one muscle of his face moved. Only his eyes shone and sparkled at her. Laura didn't move. She didn't even breathe. The Indian made two short, harsh nose, noises in his throat. The other Indian made one sound like, ha! Laura hid her eyes behind the slab again. She heard Ma take the cover off the bake oven. She heard the Indians squat down on the hearth. After a while, she heard them eating. Laura peeked and hid and peeked and hid again while the Indians ate the cornbread that Ma had baked. They ate every morsel of it and they even picked up the crumbs from the hearth. Mary stood and watched them and stroked baby's Carrie's head. Mary stood close behind Ma and held onto her sleeve. Faintly, Laura heard Jack's chain rattling. Jack was still trying to get loose. When every crumb of the cornbread was gone, the Indians rose up. The skunk smell was stronger when they moved. One of them made those harsh sounds in his throat again. Ma looked at him with her big eyes. She did not say anything. The Indian turned around. The other Indian turned too. And they walked across the floor and out through the door. Their feet made no sound at all. Ma sighed. <sighs> A long, long sigh. She hugged Laura tight in one arm and Mary tight in the other arm. And through the window, they watched those Indians going away, one behind the other, on the dim trail toward the west. Then Ma sat down on the bed and hugged Laura and Mary tighter and trembled. Ma looked sick. 
and here's the Indian walking away. So they must have just been hungry. Do you feel sick, Ma? Mary asked her. No, said Ma. I'm just thankful they're gone. Laura wrinkled her nose and said, they smelled awful. That was the skunk skins they wore, Ma said. Then they told her how they had left Jack and come into the house because they were afraid the Indians would hurt her and baby Carrie, and Ma said they were brave little girls. Now we must get dinner, she said. Pa will be here soon, and we must have dinner ready for him. Mary, bring me some wood. Laura, you may set the table. Ma rolled up her sleeves and washed her hands and mixed cornbread while Mary brought the wood and Laura set the table. She set a tin plate and a knife and a fork and a cup for Pa, and the same for Ma, with Carrie's little tin cup beside Ma's. And she set tin plates and knives and forks for her and Mary, but only the one cup that they shared between their plates. Ma made the cornmeal and water into two thin loaves, each shaped in a half circle. She laid the loaves with their straight sides together in the bake oven, and she pressed her hand flat on the top of each loaf. Pa always said he did not ask any other sweetening when Ma put the prints of her hands on the loaf. Laura had hardly set the table when Pa was there. He left a big rabbit and two prairie hens outside the door and stepped in and laid his gun on the pegs. Laura and Mary ran to Pa and clutched him and both started talking at once. What's all this? What's all this? He said, rumpling their hair. Indians. So you've seen Indians at last, have you, Laura? I noticed they have a little camp in the valley west of here. Did the Indians come into the house, Caroline? Yes, Charles, said Ma, two of them. I'm sorry, but they took all your tobacco and they ate a lot of cornbread. They pointed to the cornmeal and made signs for me to cook some of it. I was afraid not to. Oh, Charles, I was so afraid. You did the right thing, Pa told her. We do not want to make enemies of any Indians. Then he said, oof, what a smell. They wore fresh skunk skins, said Ma, and that's all they wore. Must have been a thick scent in here while they were here. It was, Charles, and we were short of cornmeal, too. Oh, well, we have enough to hold out a while, another while yet, and our meat is running all over the country now. Don't you worry, Caroline. But they took all your tobacco. Never mind, Pa said. I'll get along without tobacco till I make that trip to Independence. The main thing is to be on good terms with the Indians. We don't want to wake up some night with a band of screeching. He stopped. Laura dreadfully wanted to know what he was going to say. But Ma's eyes were pressed together and she looked a little. She shook her head at Pa. Come on, Mary and Laura, Pa said. We'll skin the rabbit and dress the prairie hens while the cornbread breaks. Hurry, I'm as hungry as a wolf. They sat on the woodpile in the wind and the sunshine and watched Pa work with his hunting knife. The big rabbit was shot through the eye and the prairie hen's heads were shot clean away. They never even knew what hit them, Pa said. Laura held the edge of the rabbit skin while Pa's knife ripped off the meat. I'll salt this skin and peg it out on the house wall to dry. It'll make a nice war warm fur cap for some little girl to wear in the winter. But Laura could not forget about the Indians. She said to Pa that if she had turned Jack loose, he would have eaten those Indians right up. Pa laid down the knife. Did you girls even think of turning Jack loose? He asked in a dreadful voice. Laura's head bowed and she whispered, yes, sir, Pa. Yes, Pa. After I told you not to? Pa said in a more dreadful voice. Laura could not speak, but Mary choked. Yes, Pa. For a moment, Pa was silent. He sighed a long sigh, like Ma's sigh after the Indians went. After this, Pa said in a terrible voice, you girls remember, always do as you're told. Don't you ever think of disobeying me. Do you hear me? Yes, Pa, Laura and Mary whispered. Do you know what would have happened if you had turned Jack loose? Pa asked. No, Pa, they whispered. He would have bitten those Indians, said Pa, and then there would have been trouble, bad trouble. Do you understand? Yes, Pa, they said, but they did not understand. Would they have killed Jack? Laura answered. Yes, and that's not all. You girls remember this. You do as you're told, no matter what happens. Yes, Pa, Laura said, and Mary said, yes, Pa. And they were so glad they had not turned Jack loose. Do as you're told, Pa said more softly, and no harm will come to you.
Well, that was an exciting chapter. Oh my goodness. So yeah, there were lots of Native Americans, what they called Indians back then, um, during that time Oops. out in the wilds, prairie. So it's natural that they would meet up and pause smart not to want to make enemies. It's better to make friends and keep peace. Okay, I will stop here.